West Africa bloc ECOWAS has rejected Niger's junta's three-year transition plan. On Saturday, a delegation from ECOWAS met Niger's ousted President Mohamed Bazoum and held talks with coup leader Abdurrahmani Tichani. General Tichani announced a national dialogue to consult on a transition back to democracy within three years. The proposal comes days after ECOWAS defense chiefs agreed a plan for possible military intervention in Niger if dialogue fails. Niger's military leaders say they remain open to dialogue. However, they would be ready to defend the country if ECOWAS deploys its forces. Nigerian, Nigerian, my dear compatriots. In short, neither the National Council for the Safeguarding of the Homeland nor the people of Niger want war and remain open to dialogue. But let there be no misunderstanding. Should aggression be undertaken against us, it will not be the walk in the park that some believe it to be. Indeed, they will find us facing 26 million Nigerians. In this context, the living forces who will be invited to attend will set about formulating within 30 days concrete proposals designed to 1. Define the fundamental principles that should govern our transition, 2. Define the priority of the transition, which should last no longer than 3 years, 3. Define national priorities during the transition, and 4. To call for fundamental values to guide the rebuilding of the republic. Well, Global Affairs Analyst Dr. Victor Kai joins us now to discuss the three-year transition plan by the Nigerian junta and ECOWAS's rejection of same. He'll also be looking at the best way to resolve the deadlock between the two parties. It's good to have you on here again on Arise News. I mean, we're still on this, uh, we're still on this conversation, but we've seen a bit of progress, just a bit of progress since the last time we spoke. And I want to know what your reaction is to this rejection of the transition plan. And also, you know, uh, uh, the general mentioned that the transition period, he promised that it would not exceed three years. How, uh, how realistic is that three years when we look at it in, you know, in the grand scheme of things? And also, um, during an interview, uh, I saw an, an interview that the ECOWAS Commissioner uh, Abdel Fattah Moussa referred to this proposal. He said it's, it's, a, it's a smoke screen for dialogue and diplomacy. What do you think about all of this? Um, I saw it coming. Um, and uh, I think I talked about it, not on this station, but I knew that um, a transition plan was, was the only way, uh, or what they were going to propose. Clearly, this has been a bloodless, I mean, it was a bloodless coup. And to introduce uh, threat and blood to it, or the threat of bloodshed, because there's no way you can attack without bloodshed if they want to take power for, uh, forcibly. Uh, would be to bring another dimension to it. If the coup, within the first few hours, if there had been a counter coup, uh, whether by cars or whatever, maybe it would have succeeded. Things have gone too far already. And um, a coup succeeds if the people on ground, the nationals, um, are in support, or let me not even say in support, not against it not outrightly against it. If they are nonchalant about it, if they don't, if it's not, a, if it's not an issue, mm -hmm. then any other intrusion from outside would be just that, an intrusion. Now, the issue of the three-year ultimatum, I, in fact, if you ask me, I think the Nigerians are more astute, or they are more astute negotiators than ECOWAS. ECOWAS fumbled when it first started with a threat Mm. You know, okay. yeah, to move in before even dialogue. And the Nigerians, or their negotiators, did a very, had a very smart, they did a very smart thing. First of all, they held on to, they had a trump card, of you know. the president? Yes, they, you know, they, holding the president. Um, they didn't kill him, so that was, that. so they had a bargaining chip, you know, a very good one at that. And then... They also made sure that, you know, he's, he's kept. If, if anything happens, uh, he'll be the first casualty. Would ECOWAS want that? Is that the kind of victory that they would want to achieve? That would obviously be a pyrrhic victory, because at the end of the day, what that would mean is that 
if you succeed in taking over, but Bazoom is there, then what have you achieved? You understand what I'm saying? And so they have kept that, and then the next thing they have done is to say, which was expected, it was unexpected to me, which is to say, okay, we're going to do have a transition program. Um, three years is also, I think, part of the negotiation strategy. If you say, if they had said... Well, you think it, three years is too long? No, it's, it's negotiation. Mm. And so when you say three years, there's room between one, one day, day and three years. Yes. Do you understand what I'm mm. saying? That's long enough. Somewhere you'll meet in between. You understand? It's easy to predict how this will go because it, the people from the ECOWAS side clearly are not as smart. Their negotiators are not as smart as the negotiators on this other side. Whether they're doing it consciously or not is another issue. Okay? So you are between one and three. You cannot attack. They can't. If they attempt to do that, they will lose more. And the price for the sub-region will be too expensive. Now, I just read somewhere that the seven states, you know, the borders have been closed and all that. And the trades that have existed for centuries have been affected. You know, these are people who live, who have been living among themselves, trading across borders and all that. So you'll find that the implosion will start from the anti-coup ECOWAS countries, first of all. In Ghana, the houses in Ghana will certainly, and I know that even the, uh, the head of the Ashanti Kingdom also has told the Ghanaian president explicitly that you cannot, we, you cannot send us to war. You, can, we cannot, you cannot ask us to go and attack our Hausa brothers. You understand what I'm saying? So within the ECOWAS countries themselves, they will start fighting a war from within. You know, apart from the war they'll be fighting from without. And what kind of war would you be seeing at the end of the day? You are going to be seeing both your conventional war and non-conventional war. Wagner will be fighting. They are very good at non-conventional non -conventional warfare, the guerrilla warfare and all that. So whereas you will be setting your gun up this way, attacking them, those ones will be attacking you from all other fronts. And from within, you would implode. Okay? I hope our people are sensible. And when I say our people, because I'm a Nigerian and, you know, my government is saying, or is leading the group that is saying, we will attack. Again, it could just be bluffing. The we will attack will be part of their strategy too, to see how much they can get. The best they can get out of this is to get Bazoom to go on exile. I don't see them coming out with any better result than that. Doctor, hi. Um, I mean... It's a lot. It is. <laughs> it is. It is because we're we're also caught up in this, whether we've asked for it or not. Now you mentioned earlier, you said if a coup succeeds, it's if the people on ground are against it. And over the weekend, we did see a, a call for volunteers, and I listened to a couple of Nigerians who were saying they were ready to give their lives. Yes. To, you know, to fight by the so by the. You will even get Nigerians leaders, who will volunteer inside by, of by Nigerians. The leaders, if need be. <laughs> When you pair this with the news, we also heard about the uh, members of the junta having evacuated their families from Niger to, I believe it's Dubai and Burkina Faso. What does this tell you about what the next move should be? And how, pre and, and though you also mentioned Wagner, you know, so Niger is preparing for potential um, military intervention. Yes. See, um, what is at stake here is the ego of the people involved. In every war, usually, every war can be ended with dialogue from the beginning. What, what causes a war to go beyond day one, let me put it that way, is really the ego of the leaders involved. Okay? And how do I mean? Um, there are implications for asking, for saying, I've said this is a bloodless coup. Eh? We all know that. Yes. Now, somebody will now say, oh, you, you small country, I want to, you want to, I, I'm talking to you and you, are, and you are telling me you will not do what I've asked you to do. Eh? So ego begins to come in. And 
if a leader is not thinking, or sorry, let me not put it that way, let me put it better. If a leader is letting his ego, or if the leaders are letting their ego get in, the next thing is, for a bloodless coup, you will now sacrifice the lives of innocent citizens, soldiers, who will go and die because your ego is involved. I, I keep talking about the issue of you know, vulnerability. A, a, proper, a good leader is not afraid to be vulnerable. You can take a decision, okay, and let that decision be based on your better judgment. I often say that discretion is a better, or it's said that discretion is a better part of valor. And so when you think about the implication, what is at stake here? One, I mean, let's examine them, okay? And who stands to lose more? Take away ego. It's true that a coup has second place. Nobody, we all don't think, most of us, I would say, me inclusive, that the military option is a, the military rule is better. I certainly don't think so, and most people don't either. And if we had a choice, we would not want a military option. So we know that that's, that's not okay. But this has happened. Now, if we do... Now, this is not Nigeria. If it's Nigeria, then whatever the government decides to do in Nigeria is okay, because it is Nigeria. This is the... This is another country altogether. The only right you have is because you have a treaty to bind you together as an economic bloc, not even a military bloc. You understand? You have a, you have a treaty binding you together, so that gives you, that makes, gives you an, a sense of entitlement to go now and interfere in their domestic and internal matter. I don't think it is right. The people should decide what they want. Now, if we go into this, what do we stand to gain? And these are the things we need to begin to look at. What do we stand to gain? What do we stand to lose? Don't forget that pipeline that is already running through their place. Mm -hmm. That will be casualty number one after Bazoom. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That will blow. Secondly, your dam, irreversibly, whether you think you are getting only 80% of your electricity from there or not or whatever, don't forget that it's also useful for irrigation. Another purpose is that is another cost. If there's a war across, don't think that this will end in one day. The thing about wars is you know how it starts, but nobody ever knows how it ends or how long it will take. This cannot be decisive. It certainly will not be. When Russia went against Ukraine, they thought it was going to be decisive, but we know better. Now the winter is coming and it's going to be a long winter, not just for the Ukrainians, but for the rest of Europe as well. You understand what I'm saying? There are implications. And if this war starts and it does not end on time, there are implications far beyond this territory. It will go right up to Europe as well. So it is important to count the costs before you even make an attempt. And so I, I said it here during, I think the other time I was, I was saying that, you know, that when I was asked the question, who should intervene at this point? He said a AU. A mm. AU has been quiet all this while. We should have a lot. They are the bigger brother. Whether we like it or yes. Excuse my English. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They should have allowed them. But we are just taking it on and moving, moving as if. If you deploy soldiers, it's easy. You do that. Maybe we have too, many, too much uh, uh, arms and uh, that we want to deploy and all that. But don't forget, we have a war even in our backyard. We have not effectively dealt with it. You understand? Now we want to go and take on another war. Is that what Nigerians have voted for? Is that what the citizens of these individual countries have voted for? I can understand Watara, but I don't understand, uh, what's his name now, uh, the Ghanaian president. I also don't understand my president. Although he's a leader, is whatever they decide. But remember, ECOWAS is no longer ECOWAS. It's fractured right now. Certainly Mali was not part of the decision. I know Burkina Faso was not part of the decision. And I'm not very sure that Guinea mm -hmm. was part of it either. And at heart, I doubt that Togo and Benin are part of that decision. We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. The English-speaking parts are the ones pushing this thing right now. And if you're not careful, it's going to be a war between Anglophone and Francophone. Francophone. 
And we don't want that. And you see, so when two elephants fight, the grass suffers. The elephants that are fighting in this case are not even on the continent. We are just the grass for economic interests. We are the grass for uh, territorial uh, interests or whatever. And when we suffer, we will suffer. The recovery. And let me also say this to you. <laughs> We are in Lagos. We think we are safe. Forget it. It's not. When, when the war starts, people will pick targets and they may, there may be destructions where we don't even expect it. I, uh, hopefully, I, you know, I just hope it doesn't come to that. But uh, of course, so. it's always uh, good to have you on here. Global Affairs Analyst Dr. Uh, Victor Ohai. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank and, you for uh, having me. And continue to review this. Mm -hmm.